Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now then, much to discuss on Monday Night Rugby. We are down to the last four in Europe. We are up and running in the Six Nations into round two. Ireland very much up and running. Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent back with us. Hello, Rory. Hey, Joe. How's it going? And she's everywhere. It's Neve Briggs. Hello. Hi, hi Joe. Yeah, we're, uh, we, we, this is the second time we've done this. We had microphone delays. You are Ireland's hardest working pundit at the moment. I'm sure you're giving me a good run for my money. <laughs> <laughs> I worry if I turn on something now and Briggs isn't there, like something's gone terribly wrong. Is she okay? <laughs> Uh, so uh, we'll get on to Final Four in Europe. Let's start with Wales nil, Ireland 45, first competitive game in almost six months. Emer Considine was talking, Eve. Uh, she scored two tries, obviously, from fullback. And she said, we knew we were fitter, we knew we were faster. And then of the game plan, she said it was nothing fancy. It was punch it up, get some gain line, get some momentum and just pick it pick out those gaps at the seams. It was the simple things, the basic stuff. We did that early in the first half and we're really happy with that. Go along with that general assessment of things? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I've been saying it for a while now about how fit they are. It's, um, you know, a huge testament to obviously their SNC and Orla Kern, but also to the players because it must have been really difficult to keep yourself at that level for the last probably year, bar that one game that they had in October, I think. Um, and they've had a lot of disappointments and, and postponements. So to be able to keep yourself motivated and and generally, like majority of them are, are training by themselves during the week. Um, true testament to that squad and their mindset, um, I thought was excellent. Um, and they did. They, they really did attack um, Wales. Their basics were quite good, um, but Wales were really poor. And... Um, it's it's kind of difficult to see where they are um as as a whole 23 um then I think next weekend will be a bigger test yeah for sure one of the few concrete points you could take from the game is the one you mentioned that they are very fired up and you could see it in their body language it felt like it was a concerted deliberate thing to celebrate the small moments and celebrate the tries and uh, listening to various people around the camp you get a sense that they've put a focus on fast fostering uh, Team unity and and really working on that, which is maybe something you know there was an area on, over the last I don't know f- couple of years they could have improved on. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know if you're lacking in some small part of the game and and you but you have a good ethos and a good spirit that can kind of make up for that. I thought, um, you know, it's always really good when you're on top and you're confident and you have the ball. The true test is when you don't have it and how you are defensively. Um, and I thought their defense was outstanding. Um, but their line speed was brilliant but also their options their picking and choosing of when to go in and, and try and compete um, but also to try and cut the edges off um, so from that perspective I think that they've obviously done a, a lot of work from it um, you know you'd still like to see a little bit more in attack I thought um, but you know you can only kind of play what's in front of you and yeah. I think that's really important to stress and their ability to pick the right option has probably been something that they've definitely evolved over the last year and um, it was brilliant I was really excited afterwards came home and I watched it probably was a little less excited after I watched it because there's definitely areas that I've that they need to improve on especially that first 20 minutes in the second half but yeah. um, from a whole perspective I thought um, it was brilliant and super it'll give those girls a huge amount of confidence and um, yeah they should be really relishing the challenge of France now yeah, and probably Rory a sense that, okay, in those 20 camps, we haven't been wasting our time, you know, because yeah, there's always going to be that nervousness that you get out and how are we looking. Neve mentioned the second half. They were 31 nil up at half time. They didn't score again until Dorothy Wall's try in the 72nd minute. So that period in the second half, errors started to creep in. Yeah, I was covering that for Exeter, so I got to watch the first 25 minutes before I, I switched over. And, you know, if they kept up the rate of scoring that they, they had started with, they'd have won by 80 or 90 points, you know. So, I mean, it was it was unrealistic to expect that, but they definitely dropped their standards. When I watched it back today, they didn't uh, meet the standards that they had in the first half. But I think part of that was probably, partly the fact that they haven't played in so long and, and the fact that, you know, they probably ran out of steam a little bit. Partly the fact that they knew they were so much better than their opposition who didn't look particularly, you know, anywhere near as well conditioned as they were. And also they have a massive game to focus on for next week. So I think there was a combination of a few factors that led to them. For the slippage, you know, I think when the bench came on, eventually it did lift things again. But, it, you know, I think it'd be hard to look at a 45-0 win in, in your open, in your first game in six months and find too many too many flaws. And when you have 
players of the caliber and the you know the excitement that Dorothy Wall and, and David Parsons can generate. It's it's uh, it's pretty exciting time for this team and. Um, you know, this Six Nations has been very lopsided so far. Ireland need to be on the right side of those big score lines. They need to be the best of the rest, especially with the, the competition, the new competition, the 15s coming in, in uh, 2023. And they look like they're on the right track. They just need the RFU to kind of back them on that journey. You mentioned Parsons, who's 19 years of age now, Bevan Parsons, broke into the squad age 16. She was on with Jaron Neal this morning talking about her development over the last couple of years. Have a listen. You know, I think my my game knowledge has definitely improved. Being able to position myself in the backfield, you know, that's something I struggled with when I first came in and I was always caught out of position or things like that. So my defences come on in leaps and bounds. And then in terms of attack, I think I've just grown a bit more confident. And was it, was it daunting at the time coming in? Like being a 16-year-old coming into an international team sports at senior level, I imagine you're probably looking around going, God, this is this is the real deal. Yeah, you know, I'd be lying to you if I if I told you I wasn't intimidated coming in those those first few training camps. I was, you know, thrown in the deep end really. Um the girls were so experienced and so, you know, their skill level was much higher than mine and they knew the game a lot better than me. Um so yeah that that those first few camps and that first season I was definitely you know, awestruck by the girls and and um, luckily enough, they took me under their wing. But I think since then, I've been able to, you know, create a really good bond with them. At the time, I thought it was it was a weird dynamic, me being so young and the age gap and everything. But now that's, that's not even a, a thought. You know, I'm as close with the girls as ever. And, you know, it's a great squad to be on. And I remember hearing as well, like, you couldn't even share a hotel room with one of your teammates when you were inside in that camp because you were because you were 16 years old. Yeah, so COVID hasn't hasn't been uh, that big of a change for me in that sense because we all have to have single rooms now anyway. But yeah, so I'd room on my own. I'd be, you know, the far side of the hotel. Um, it, it was a bit, it was madness really. Um, so I've only ever had two roommates in, in my whole time being on the squad because then COVID came in. Um, I think one time Rugby Players Ireland, they're like an organisation that helped us and they came in talking about pensions and pension plans. And I was just thinking like, this is in <laughs> insane. Like I'm trying to get my maths homework done before Monday and they're talking about pensions. Um, so the, the age gap was definitely, you know, a, a topic of conversation at the time. Neve, where is she now and how good can she get? Because she's still so young. Um, yeah, she's definitely on that track to being absolutely world class. Um, I thought she was unbelievable at the weekend. And not just her, you know, finishing ability, because um, let's face it, you know, she's been top of the charts to bat. But I was also watching her work off the ball and um, her ability to get into the tight. There was a couple of times like before Dorothy Walls try, she carried in that tight. She put herself forward to get, you know, and that's not something we're really used to with the wingers. And and so from that perspective, um, she's definitely right. Her game knowledge, her game appreciation um, is like it's just on a fast track and like basically the rugby world is her oyster because she's so so talented and athletically um you know like this unbelievable specimen that i've never seen before she's ridiculously powerful and um and then comes across as a very humble mature you know kid i think mm. i you know her her interview beforehand on, on rte i was just blown away blown away by how well she spoke nothing seems to phase her um so yeah i think the whole policy of trying to get her the ball as early as possible as quick as possible seems to work from the beginning um and you know she shouldn't fear any team even the big ones because um she's more than capable of of, uh, of of matching them. And who else on the Irish team is in that bracket approaching world class or at world class level? Yeah, there's a few, obviously Claire Malloy, you know, 71 caps now and and leading from that back row always. And um, But I think Darley Wall has that potential, definitely. You know, we saw a huge amount of patches of her physicality is, you know, we don't, we're not blessed with huge, big physical players like in England or France, for say. Um, so we've got to be smart toward how we play. But with Dorothy, she gives us an out. Now, I thought she carried unbelievably well the other day, but carried a huge amount. Um, and I hope that other players can step up and take that from her in, you know, like help her out a little bit in terms of that pressure. Um, 
but it's her physical stakes in terms of her ability to hit hard tackles. She got through an awful amount of work, um, and that back row is probably the most balanced we've had in a long time. Long time, and I think um, it was brilliant to see they're obviously incredibly hard working, but they all bring something different. You know, from Lloyd's footwork and her ability to post. Junior's just the most hard working player I've ever played with and against, and mm. and then Doherty having this physical um, attribute that you know we haven't been able to kind of match in that sense. So um, yeah, look, at, there's there's no small snippets around hugely positive from so many players um, and you know I think it bodes well for the future I think it, you know you often questioned whether they could get to any intensity in those 20 camps that could match test level and you know clearly they did because they came out of the blocks firing and and Rory's right you know after half time it was a combination of probably do you know when you're so excited and you come out and you're a million miles an hour and it's like this steam train and then mm. you come in at half time and you take a breath it's hard to kind of get that back up again straight away and I think they knew they were going to win they were in control of the scoreboard I would have just liked to have seen them take control of the game more in that you know 20 minute spell but um yeah there it was just a really really positive performance you're both uh, acknowledging and dancing around the fact, I suppose, that it was such a comfortable uh, win and that overshadows everything. If we look at rounds one and two in the Six Nations thus far, England beat Scotland 52-10, France beat Wales 53-zip. At the weekend, England put 67 points on Italy, Ireland obviously 45-0 uh, against Wales. So four matches. The smallest winning margin here is 42 points and in two of the matches, over 50 points between the teams. So this is a big problem for the tournament. If you're a floating voter, and look, maybe at this stage, it's not about the neutral. Each country should just generate partisan support and get excited and get behind their team. Although I don't know if the Welsh <laughs> can get behind their team at the moment. But certainly for the floating voter, or for the neutral, or for where this tournament uh, wants to go, Rory, there are the haves and the haves-nots, very much so. And, and we're seeing that uh, along professional lines. Like, it's incumbent really, really quickly on Wales, on Scotland and on Ireland to start ring fencing some serious money. And if, if professionalism is the standard that England and to a lesser extent France are setting, then these other countries are going to have to meet that pretty quickly. Or This tournament just becomes very hard to get into. Absolutely. And uh, the women's game is a, is a blank canvas in many ways. I mean, they've moved out of the... The traditional men's window they've got a structure for this tournament that you know it's a once-off because of covid and i don't think it's going to work because it's too short and it's it's not enough games but it is you know the, the gulf in class between the top teams and the bottom teams is is uh is too big and i guess there are other teams in europe who could could potentially you know if you were to be able to get away from the the, the traditional six nations that are basically ba based on men's rugby they're only you know it's basically being copied across mm. Or if you bring in USA, Canada, if you can try and get like there is this tournament happening for 2023 that the Six Nations will be a qualifier for. I think what's imperative for Irish women's rugby and for Irish rugby really because it's not a women's issue, it's it's an Irish rugby issue, is that Ireland is part of that elite train as it takes off because Wales looked like a team that even though like Wales of the two teams on Saturday, Wales are the one who are at the World Cup next year. Ireland haven't guaranteed their place yet. Now if they keep playing the way they played on Saturday, they'll get there. Italy do seem to to be quite competitive. I know England blew them away in the end, but Italy have, have had good results recently. Um, Ireland need to be on the train when it leaves the station because I think there are it's it's not a huge amount of teams that are that are that are moving in the in the right direction, but the the ones that are seem to be moving very very quickly. And the RFU can't really prevaricate around this. I think there is commercial goodwill out there. I mean, if you you just I mean, the amount of women's rugby players this week who were up for interview for commercial gigs this week is much more than I've ever seen before. I think there is, I spoke to a guy about, you know, Baby and Parsons for Peace on Saturday about kind of the commercial viability of the players themselves. And he said, look, there are brands out there that don't want to be associated with men's rugby players. They want to be associated with women's rugby players. I don't think that potential is there to drive full on professionalism just yet. And obviously the RFU are in a position where they're laying off staff. Yeah. But this, I think there is we're at a pretty interesting point in the, in the global women's game and the Six Nations is maybe exposing, sorry, it is exposing. It has done for a couple of years, probably since Neve's team, Ireland haven't been part of that elite. It's been England and France. Ireland need to be clinging on to that as it leads the station and, and making sure they're part of that conversation. And I think they have to be the team hammering other teams, not being the team being hammered, if you know what I mean, and have to be kind of a good, strong uh, proposition when it comes to any global tournaments or, or whatever the future looks like and I think having stars in the of the game of the caliber of 
Davin Parsons and, and Dorothy Wall. And, and like obviously some of them are senior players, but those are the players that are going to be around for the next decade, mm. driving things on. You know, that's why it's an encouraging time to be kind of getting things right because things were pretty grim for for a couple of years. They need to get into that World Cup next year, which is in New Zealand, which is a really important. I think would be a really important tournament for women's rugby because of that tournament kicking off in 2023. So I think, you know, we can't worry too much about what Wales are doing and it doesn't look like they're doing an awful lot based on Saturday. No. I think Ireland need to be getting themselves together to, 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 to join onto that, that train. Yeah. That train is uh, leaving, if not left, Neve. So, I mean, they'll have to catch up pretty quickly. What's a realistic first step? Identify... 15 to 20 players who can train full time and be paid a wage that they're happy with and that the RFU are happy with and, and that way professionalism begins or is that an unrealistic first jump in the next and look Rory mentioned the RFU situation I think they laid off 20 people last week so finances are tight obviously at the moment but in the next kind of 18-24 months is there a, a is that the talk within Irish women's rugby that it has to get there pretty quickly given what's happened in England and where France are? No, because I, I think that gap is too wide. Um, so I think if you make 20 girls professional tomorrow morning, you know, that's not going to close the gap, I think. Um, and would it not? Because I'd be saying like, well, they're almost a professional team that train amongst themselves and you get them high quality opposition. I'm not sure, you know, you work out the ins and outs of it, but they're they're effectively like Team Ireland and maybe there aren't enough games across a year to justify that. I don't know. I, I don't think it's that. I just think... Um, you know, Ireland is still evolving its structures and its game. I think, you know, I think at the time, I don't, I'm not sure the RFU jumped on or, you know, caught the light of, of the 2013 kind of um, that team, that year, that's Grand Slam. I think it's only yeah. in recent years that they've started to put money into the provinces in terms of, um, you know, development officers and um, and creating pathways for young girls to be able to play rugby. And I think it, it's we'll see that benefit the likes of you know Dorothy Walls and Emmy Lanes and your Breens they're all coming from that same era I think mm. and um it's it's going to take another four or five years for that next crop to come up um and then you're looking at the likes of Baby Parsons and these girls to they're then going to be the leaders if that makes any sense. I yeah. think I think a big thing you know about the, the game of the weekend is a something seriously going going on behind the scenes in Wales because they have 23 girls that are playing in the Premiership in England. Ireland have, you know, six, three of them are injured, so they had three girls available. Um, so they're playing rugby week in, week out. So there's obviously something amiss in relation to their camp. I think for us um, and, and us being Ireland, that, you know, it's not a case, a simple case of just throwing money at them and making them professional, because I think that gap um, in terms of the game um, is, is quite wide anyway. So I think, you know, the player... Pool, the the numbers that France and England have generated, the ability to have um twenties teams, um underage camps, um you know they they have pathways in place for nearly every girl to play rugby from the age of under eight up, um and Ireland have to get that. So in order to you know and and it's important that you just have that pathway in terms of if for example you know. 10 girls tomorrow retired from Ireland, mm. well then they need the next layer to keep coming up. And at the moment, there's too much of a gap between those international players and then the, the next best. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So look, I take your point. It's a bigger conversation than just the immediate 15 or 23. I, I That's quite a short-term view. I'm One I'm outlaying, absolutely the pathways have to come in. So the 15s team wouldn't have been looking enviously over at the sevens who were professional. Oh, look, of course. Like, I was in that position too. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and if, they, if they had said to you, look, Neve, we're thinking of doing this whereby, yes, the pathways and the overall development is crucial, but we're going to make you and the other 20 frontliners uh, professional and, uh, would, you know, you're willing to park your career and these, you know, these are the terms and you get to train every day, you're at the high performance unit, you know, your, your life is about improving individually and if all 20 of you are doing that, then in the short term results will improve and we'll get closer to England. What would your reaction have been? See, oh, it's such a tough question and I'll tell you why, because, um, you know, my career as a guard was obviously really important to me, mm. but also I was earning good money and I'm, you know what I mean? And if you're going to make 20 girls, you know, professional and it's going to be in around the same, you know, you're talking around less than, you know, 18, between 15, around 15,000, like, 15, 20, yeah. that, no, it'd that, have to be better, you know. Like. No, 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 it couldn't, and, it couldn't be that. That's what the sevens it, is, isn't it? That, that's what I'm saying. And yeah. then, like, England women's team, you know, it's only 
seven or eight grand more than that. Okay. Um, so, and, um, you know, so the, that type of, like that has to be all taken into account as well. And it's a case of, well, you know, I was too old by the time, you know, I didn't start playing rugby I was in my tw- early, very early twenties. Whereas somebody like Baby Ian, Dorothy Wall, who are in college, mm. it could sit down to the ground because they have, you know, like I, I've probably 10 years into my rugby career when this even started to come about in terms of the sevens girls. And, and, you know, I went in there, took time off work and went in there, you know, 2016 to try and qualify for Rio. And yeah, look, it was brilliant. I really enjoyed training full time, but I missed working too. And so mm. like, that's just me. Like I, I understand that hundred percent, there'll be definitely girls in that squad that would absolutely grab it by, by, by with both hands and run with it. But I think thinking long term like if i was 16 sure. 17 18 years of age 100 percent, i'd do it because i you know at that age you just don't think long term whereas now i'm getting older i i'm i would definitely be thinking oh god like that's i'm only going to be earning this much money i have to live in dublin how am i going to be able to afford that yes like they're all things that are that have to be and you can't expect the rfu to be giving out big huge contracts because the money the game makes the sponsorship it's not it's not a like for like with the men's mm. and you know or no Rory kind of as alluded to that it's it's not even near it or do you know what I mean so you can't demand those kind of things I think if you maybe looked at you know a younger squad so maybe you know the girls that are in college and offered them some sort of bursary or, or fee or whatever it is that they can you know train the morning train the evening type thing that they're doing now but it just yeah. that it makes things easier if they're not having to work at weekends or something and um, maybe but yeah look i think that's just like there's just way too many outside factors for me to just say cut and dry let's go professional in the morning no it's a it's a brilliant nuanced answer and you can expect lots of text messages from mates saying they didn't realize you were such a big earner in the guards uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't realize life was so well, good in there uh, no well I'm, I'm talking about 15 grand for for playing rugby for i know for i'm Ireland joking and, and i'm joking and yeah but i'm uh, probably going to get a lot of messages now of telling me how good hey look be, benchmarking you know, work to treat work to treat um Absolutely. But Rory, I guess, so Neve makes the point, like what the women's game bringing in isn't comparable with the men's game. And that's, you know, that's definitely going to be um, a point others will make. At the same time, last time I checked, the men's international senior team bring in, is it 82 or 87% of all revenue anyway? So yeah. it's, you know, it's not like, you know, the, the men's game is washing its face everywhere anyway. Like it's so dependent on uh, these 7, 8, 9, 10, 13 games across the year that the senior men's team play. So... You know, in that context, in that context, it might be something over the next couple of years that we start having to talk about very seriously when the likes of England are leading the way. Well, also, it's the commitment levels. And maybe it's a government scheme like the one that the, G- the GA players get. Um, but if we're asking players, hopefully they finish in the top three of the Six Nations and they go and play in that annual global tournament. Well, like, how are they going to take time off work and, and how are they going to put their careers on hold? To play for Ireland when they're getting, you know, like apart from the obviously emotional reward and the the the, the 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 athletic satisfaction of it, they're getting nothing else for it. And then their male counterparts are on central contracts upwards of three hundred grand. You know, I think that the women's game, I think the RFU need to be bold in trying to, to, you know, to lead the women's game and to try and set up competitions, whether whether it's getting the provinces into an expanded premiership or whether it's at, at at least small a small number of teams in an AIL that get and then they go and attract sponsors and they they sell it they sell it more whereas now at the moment it's kind of a it is a poor relation and they they they, like they do a good job around the national team at times and obviously you know the move to Donnybrook has worked well in terms mm. of getting crowds in but even like they weren't able to play any of the like the game against France this week in the Aviva even though the Aviva is not being used at the moment and they, you know they'll say it's because they are the um no, they're used to energy park and they didn't really want to leave but at the same time you know seeing them play there might have been a a, a nice message to send out and, and maybe that's a pat in the head so i don't know maybe it's not important but i think we are at a point where there's comp- you know where, where it's coming into the equation and they can watch other teams like new zealand england france pull away or they can try and get involved and try and drive it and try and shape things as far as i know they were quite reluctant to get involved in the the World Rugby thing from 2023. I keep remembering forgetting the name. It's, I think it's Women's 15. It's, it's going to be called um, XV. XV. Yeah, it's from 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 2023. But like that's where it's going to be at for the next couple of years. But you're asking an awful lot of these players to try and play in it every year if it's going to be held mm-hmm. in South Africa. Like South Africa appointed Lynn Cantwell, um, who he would know well as their their 
director director of performance. Um, you know, uh, like she's a massive loss, I think, to Irish rugby. Like she could drive things hugely here, and and would I think have, you know, good ideas and would have the level of knowledge that I wouldn't have around it to, to drive things. But you know, she's off running things for Adi Erasmus instead. So I mean, there's you know, I think there there is definite potential that is untapped at the moment in, in Irish women's rugby, and I think Irish women's rugby can be part of that move in the next couple of years that I think is already happening. Um. They're kind of being dragged along with it at the moment. I think they could drive it more. Okay. It's, I, I sorry. Think, sorry. Yeah, Neve, I'll give I you think, a final word. Yeah, final word. I, th- I think, I do think it, it has to come in the next five, six, seven, eight, ten years. I think it has to come. Like professionalism, it's the way the game is going. It's, it has to come. I just think that the RFU have to continue to keep building what's underneath it for me at the moment. In, sure. For in, this short term, like hardship for a long-term game to be able to when we when it does happen that you're competing with the best and more than capable of competing okay we'll come back to this and then tease it out a bit more like i'd love to get your sense of what it, what are the pathways like at the moment and uh you know where are the shortcomings at the moment but we're gonna take a short break we are into the last four of europe we have uh, la rochelle and leinster to look forward to and an interesting weekend to look back on in just a second with neve briggs and rory o'connor monday night rugby on off the ball With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Now, let's talk Leinster against La Rochelle in the semi-final. Leinster beat Exeter at the weekend. La Rochelle beat Sale. Uh, Racing are out. Bordeaux will play to lose. Bordeaux 24, Racing uh, 21. Matthew Jalabert kicked all of Bordeaux's points. Roman Intimac kicked all of Toulouse's against Claremont. So it's Bordeaux against uh, Toulouse. Ulster into a Challenge Cup semi-final. They were 35-27 winners against Northampton. Uh, Cooney and Stockdale with second half tries. We had the game here um, from Sandy Park on Saturday. And it's picked off by Rory O'Loughlin and Rory O'Loughlin has intercepted it and he's running towards the try line and Rory O'Loughlin can run straight for the airport because Leinster are over for another try and they are going through to the Heineken Champions Cup semi-finals. 34 points to 22 all in. Uh, 14 nil down after eight minutes. Tom O'Flaherty had scored uh, two tries. Johnny Sexton removed on 28 minutes. He failed his HIA. That's his third HIA in as many months, which illustrates the dangers of the sport, unfortunately. And uh, a way to defending champions. So at that point, Rory, you would have to say there's a lot going against Leinster, to say the least. I mean, uh, this compares very favourably with any of their great wins. You would have to say maybe I look Northampton final for drama and everything else and I think Claremont away in 2012 was a major one and Harlequins 09 had a certain kind of gritty quality as well but this compares with any of them what you would have to think not least from 14 nil down after eight minutes. Yeah I think Munster 09 is up there as well. I, I, I we were it's funny we were chatting that we on a zoom call uh or Microsoft Teams call with Leo Cullen after the game and he, he was somewhere else in the stadium and the call was ongoing and the journalists were kind of chatting about it and we came up with those three or four, and then we asked Leo Cullen when he sat down, "Where does it where does it rank in his eyes?" And he's went, "Lads, it's a quarter final. You know, they don't matter. You just they're just about winning. That you know, it's it's not worth. No one will remember this as Lens, one of Lancer's great European wins if they don't win in La Rochelle, um, and that was the way he was looking at it. And maybe that's the way he has to look at it. I think it stands alone in that certainly in, in that company. It was um, it was a really phenomenal performance. They looked like I think when Sexton went off and Byrne came on, Byrne looked so assured. It wasn't. It, that wasn't the point at which you worried for them. The point at which you worried for them was after eight minutes when uh, Exeter ran in their second try and, and carved, you know, Leinster were ill-disciplined. They were poor in defence. They were missing tackles. You'd never see them miss. They were passive. And and somehow they rested the momentum of the game back without even, you know, really, like there was no moment where, you, you know, there was no big one moment where, where they, 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 they you could pinpoint as the moment that they changed the game. Mm. They just slowly but surely ramped up their game and ramped up their game and, and put pressure onto Exeter and and it it was the English team that looked like the ones that were that had been sucker punched. They were the ones starting to make errors. They were starting to panic even though we were, they were in a really good position. 
And they started the second half almost as badly as they started the first half, Leinster. And yet they still managed to, to do that again. And, and you don't see many teams who are able to do that. You know, it was really, really, really impressive across the board. Their tries were really well taken. Their game management is excellent. Their tactics were superb. Um, host of their players were just physically incredible. Um, Josh van der Fleur has reinvented himself. Robbie Henshaw's in the form, like I, I'm about the 50, I'm sure I'm about the 50th person to say this and off the ball in the last while, but he's like, he's in this career best form, basically. Ronan Kelleher looks like a lion. Ryan Baird came off the bench and won three line outs against the head, smashing lads back. They were like, we were, this is a team we were talking, we were worried about their physicality a couple, you know, when Saracens beat them and, and here they are absolutely wiping the floor with Exeter. Like, the, you know, after, after eight minutes, they won the game so comprehensively. It was, it was an, an outrageously good performance and they just look like such a well coached team well drilled team they know their role so well it was it was excellent mm. Neve, you wouldn't have seen this live would you with the Ireland match no I watched it Sunday morning and okay. um, I was blown away by them thought they were brilliant I thought their ability to pressurise Exeter into making mistakes I, I, I watch a good bit of the Premiership and I see watch Exeter's games most weekends because I love how they play and um, I had ever seen them make as many bad decisions or mistakes as I had and I think that's down to pressure I don't think it was anything to do with you know them themselves I think it was all Leinster's doing I thought they were just so clinical and they're you know the calm there was just no panic Mm. you almost kind of you were like there was nobody freaking out after eight ten minutes you know we as supporters for them were probably going oh my god it's gonna be a long day at the office um but no there wasn't and their ability just to do the basics at high tempo all the time um, is one of the best I've seen and I just I thought they were excellent yeah I, I, I asked you the live question because I think certainly watching live at 14 nil down when all week the build up has been about how this is going to be an unbelievably tight game you know there's there's going to be very little between these two teams this has 50-50 quality every point will be vital and suddenly 14 point head start you know like what struck me Neve, as well when you can see two tries like that you've been out there on a pitch I'm sure when things haven't gone to plan I would presume it's very easy then for defensively players to get very jittery to start making some Hail Mary reads because they sense something is off and for you know a bit of indecision to get in there or to go off script defensively that didn't seem to happen at all no, it didn't, and that's what I was just saying there. It's just a sense of calm, you know. It's it's like it's fine. We'll just go back up and we'll just score. When you know, don't like, don't worry. Just keep sticking to your process. Mm. Keep sticking to the system that we have. You know, they made some unbelievable tackles, and and not just the starting team. You know, Ross Maloney, right? Bear comes on, absolutely smashes um one of the extra players, and and the lift that that gives to everybody around them is is so so good. And look, I think like. Their balance of this team is what makes them so good, you know, and I've spoken about the embarrassment of riches that Leinster have, but it just seems that no matter who comes in to whatever position, they're just so, so good all the time. Everybody just knows what they're doing, where their job is. Um, and yeah, I just, I'd love to just go into like one of their train sessions, just watch it when they're having one of those internal games. Cause it reminds me of like, you know, the old Kenny teams that would be absolutely lettering each other because they mm. must be so competitive um, to try and, you know, it's, to be selective because you want to be playing on a team like that. I thought, as as Rory said, Josh Van Der was brilliant, but I I thought Luke McGrath was outstanding again. I mm-hmm. thought he you know he really just it was just this sense of it just goes to show where their mindset is and where they are as a team. It was just a sense of okay, look, we've just led in two tries, but you know basically it was two missed tackles. It wasn't a system error. It wasn't anything else. So let's just make those tackles and we'll be fine. And mm. they had two big turnovers in their own 22 as well, which I thought was unbelievable. Their set piece was brilliant. Um, so yeah, look, they, and we spoke beforehand too about, you know, whoever was going to win this game was probably going to win the tournament. And I don't think that changed anything after this weekend. Yeah. On uh, Ross Byrne and the assurance he brought, Rory, one of the reasons that probably uh, offered a level of calm to everyone is that his introduction basically is being part of this brilliant try at pace, offset piece. And, you know, like he gets a lot of criticism there's times where <laughs> over the last year I, I drive home afterwards and think my god I hope Ross Byrne doesn't listen to any of this crap because <laughs> you know he gets compared to Sexton he gets compared to his brother and it's like nothing he can do is ever good enough he's played in 27 Heineken Champions Cup games he's lost one like he's doing plenty right yeah absolutely I'd love to see him get a run in an Ireland, an Ireland shirt you know I, I, I wonder if 
if like the the way he's been played, and maybe I shouldn't have gone straight to Ireland. Maybe I should focus in on the positives of his game on Saturday because it was exceptional. And and he was you remember that quarter final against Ulster when you know he basically dragged Leinster through that game mm. uh, a couple of years ago as well, and that was a pivotal moment in the in the 2018 win, wasn't it? So like. I think he gets, yeah, he gets unfair. Crit- I don't even know if it's criticism. I think he gets overlooked an awful lot, and I think part of it is because people just don't think he's quite test level. But he's not playing test level here. Like he's playing at, at the, the the next best thing, and he's he's excelling at it, and he's he's running the game. He just looks so comfortable in that system. He so he, he looks like the coaches trust him. He knows that. He knows that the players around them trust him. And he's got enormous confidence. And he never looks that confident when he comes onto the pitch playing for Ireland. He, he never looks as assured. And that's partly because his, I think his two starts to date have been at Twickenham, one of which was a, when they tried to take Twickenham on the, you know, in England on the fly before the World Cup after a week in Portugal. That was mostly a fitness session. And he wasn't, you know, the team weren't well prepared. And, and he, he shipped pretty much all of the blame for that day internally. So, you know, he hasn't had a fair run at international rugby. I'm not convinced personally that he's quite going to be Ireland's next next out half but I think he he is all very much good enough to be Leinster's next out half and Leinster are so good and they've built such good structures around them that whatever limitations he does have they're not exposed in any way and and he you know he's played center for them this year and he's looked really really good there as well I mean he's he's a really really good um intelligent player he's obviously Mentally very strong. His goal kicking is excellent. I mean, he missed one very difficult one on mm. Saturday, but like everything else, he, he nailed. And the passes and the timing of his pass around the tries, like there were the decision to go wide to Larmer got early. I know they were on penalty advantage, but that gave Larmer that extra second to make that incredible finish that Larmer did. And it was great to see Larmer playing that well as well after a kind of a fairly mixed international window and, and James Lowe. So, I mean, all these players, like Luke McGrath can't get into the Ireland squad. These would have can't get into the Ireland team, and and like they look like absolute world beaters when they're wearing that blue jersey. It, they, it's it's such an incredible machine that it makes everyone look look so much better within it. And uh, Ross Byrne, if if Johnny like the biggest compliment you could play him is that I wouldn't say Leinster are, are massively worried about Johnny Sexton for the next couple of weeks. Obviously they're worried for his health, but if he doesn't make La Rochelle, I think they'd be pretty confident going over there with Ross Byrne at ten and his brother backing him up and. Uh, for all that I would have been calling for Harry Byrne to get fast tracked into the Irish shirt, Leinster certainly aren't in any rush to fast track him at the moment because he, because his brother is that good. We did get glimpses of uh, what Exeter were about. Neve like started the second half. It was one of their first real forays into the twenty-two and line out, and just you, you just can't stop them that close to the line. And it illustrated the point that Leinster did not want to let them into their own twenty-two that often. That was you know a big part of this game. Late on, Leinster defended on their own try line again, and a chance where usually you feel Exeter would just keep picking and going and picking and going and scoring. How did Leinster manage to avoid being in that position too often in that game? Because it can't be coincidence that Exeter weren't mauling try after try after try in this game. Yeah, I think it was the work that they did up the pitch. I thought, you know, their line speed, um, they gave no time on the ball to, to Joe Simmons or, or to Stuart Hogg. I think they, you know, they literally squeezed them back to making poor decisions or poor kicks so that they were in control and you know sometimes you don't need the ball to control rugby matches and Leinster showed that in abundance the other day I thought and um, their you know their ability to compete at the breakdown yeah but also knowing when to compete like Josh van der Fleer was brilliant but not just him I thought Ronan Kelleher had two or three steals but if you couldn't watch him like you know, especially the one, the first one that he got in the second half, like he's he's following the play almost behind each rock, and then the minute he has a half a steal in, and and when you get under that kind of pressure, and as a team like Exeter, and then you you get into a stage where you, you know you can score, the, it's almost like double fold because you think, well, we've worked so hard to get here, they wouldn't have been used to that at all, um, and we have to score now. Whereas when they're playing the Premiership, they probably visit the twenty two you know, 10, 12 times mm, and, mm. and come away with six, eight scores. Whereas because Leinster had squeezed them so far up the pitch um, and like their work rate off the ball was just phenomenal. And um, and like, it's a really interesting point where Rory was saying there, like they all seem to, you know, 
look like world beaters or world class when they're in, in, a, in a blue jersey. I think that's just down to the fact of how well they're coached in terms of everybody knows their job. So if you're so detailed and you know exactly what you're going to do, well, it just makes the person's job beside you a little bit easier. And if they put in the same commitment and same detail, well, then it's just it's a ripple effect across everybody else. So every, it just makes the game way easier, if that makes any sense. OK, because I, um, I, I honestly looked at, I mean, what do I know? But I do wonder as well, well, if it's just a drop in level and that's the other part of this, if we're being brutally honest. Well, but Robbie Henshaw came out after the game, didn't he, and say that it felt like a test level match. And Almost, he um, said. I'm being pedantic. He said almost. OK, well, almost. And, and they probably weren't far off it. You know, there was a lot of internationals playing in that, in that team. But I think um, I think Exeter kind of imploded because of the pressure that Leinster put on them. Yeah. On van der Fleer, uh, so he had 22 tackles and he had uh, steal, uh, uh, steals at the breakdown as well. Excuse me. It was interesting in commentary, Brian Driscoll and BT was making the point that Andy Farrell has told him he needs to be more dynamic in his carries and that's something he's gone and worked on, Rory. Again, is it, that's one of those things. Is that uh, brilliant Leinster coaching, as Neve is saying, where he can flourish or is it you know just a, that smidgen below test level where he can flourish that bit more carrying the ball? No, because I think we saw it in the England game as well. So I don't, I don't think it's that... I think there's been a definite shift in Josh van der Fleer in, in, in the last three or four months uh, since he got dropped midway through the Six Nations uh, for Will Connors. I think, like, Josh van der Feer, I've always had the sense from interviewing him, he's he's just one of the nicest people I've ever come across in, in, in interviews and work. Um, and when you're an open side, like, you don't want your open side flanker to be the nicest guy in the team. And, and I think he, the penny has dropped a little bit and I don't think he's changed his personality necessarily, but I think he's, he's not going around like kicking cats or stealing no, handbags I, well, from I, old women in the street, not, no? You know, that'd be a terrible reflection on the sport and on the pressure that he's under. But no, it, I think it's not that he's become, it's not, a, it's not even because he's become, tried to be a nasty player because sometimes players can force that stuff. Yeah. But there's a vicious, viciousness about the way he's carrying the ball now that he was always a very punchy carrier, but there's just an extra le- level of menace about the way he's going into contact. And like, he, it was never that he was protecting himself before, but he's just, he's, I don't know what he's done, whether it's technical, whether it's a mind, it's probably a bit of a bit of everything, mm. but he is absolutely thundering into collisions and winning collisions that he, that he wouldn't have won before. He was always, he was never the greatest jackler for seven, but his jackal seems to have improved. And again, that's, that's a bit of bloody mindedness as well. So I think it's, it, I think that stung during the Six Nations, and he, and then because Will Connors did his knee in that in that train, training session the week of the England game, he got back in, and it was actually apparent in one of the Leinster games. I think it might have been the Ulster game during the Six Nations when he got dropped back to Leinster and, and he played for them, and he looked like he was playing with a serious serious chip on his shoulder. And maybe it just shows that, you know, if you if you if you are uncomfortable in the Ireland setup and you were told this is what you need to do to get back in. And someone takes your place for a few weeks. It's not the end of the world if you react well, and he's reacted really, really well. And it's it's like he now looks like you know I wouldn't have had him down as as a lion this summer, but it, like the way he's playing right now, he, it'd be hard to keep him off that plane. And and he's certainly you know I let you're missing three serious uh, number sevens, mm. but they're not missing them at all at the moment because he's playing so well. He's, yeah, he's just brilliant. outstanding. Brilliant, yeah. It doesn't hurt, you know, doing that against English opposition and all the rugby world watching it. You know, it's a high-profile game and Jack Conan very good as well. So, look, that's Leinster. Neve, you said they they were the two best teams in the competition and so we're, we're nudging Leinster now into favourites tag. La Rochelle, I mean, it's just kind of funny how this, <laughs> this has uh, worked out. So, uh, Ronan O'Gara and John O'Gibbs up against uh, Leinster. They beat Sale 45-21, uh, broad terms like the first 25 minutes of this were is kind of tetchy enough cup rugby not a huge amount happened then La Rochelle scored a very good try and then got a try out of nothing and then Sale responded and it was like 18-16 or, or you know two point gap certainly at half time and within the first 12 minutes of the second half Raymond Rule had scored two really good tries and La Rochelle pulled away they dominated up front it wasn't as easy as the scoreline might suggest at a glance. Like it did feel tight, certainly at half time, but they they ran out worthy winners, and now it's Leinster, which is you know, um, <laughs> no hype needed. So where where are La Rochelle? How good are they? Yeah, I think they're they're. I thought they were excellent the last two times I watched them. In, you know the two knockout games, obviously Gloucester the previous week and and last weekend. Um, I think. You know, everybody was on about Levani Batia after after the Gloucester game, and I thought he was very quiet the weekend. Mm. And and yet, the likes of Raymond ruled and 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 Dusan, are, you know, 
come up with these brilliant plays and and great finishes and and or do land sorry and you think oh god like they seem to have power and, and pace around but it's that back row for me that sets the stall for them like right. Victor Vilos um Aldred and and Gordon I thought they were they were excellent but um I I still think um this is probably at their level in terms of you know how far they go I think mm. there's question marks over like you know their goal kicking I like hear West seems to miss quite a few he's not as consistent as as say a Ross Byrne or Johnny Zexton um, and yeah. there's always they're always going to leave points behind them I think and so from that aspect I think um, you know that will definitely be a worry for them um, but um, yeah look I think like their, their pack are so strong like um, but yet you know I don't think they're as mobile and as good as what Exeter were so you know, I I do I apart from that back row, um, I I do think that um, Lencer's pack would be way better in terms of their ability to play ball and stuff like that. And like Kerr Barlow is a really good scrum half. You know, he's played for New Zealand. He, he's excellent at controlling the ball, but you can only do so much when I think you know your 10, 12, 13 can go hiding in games at times and they can go missing. And I thought at stages against Sale, you know, they did that. I thought they were quiet in patches, and and that's you know, something that doesn't really happen too often at this level, at this stage is, you know, as you get to cup rugby and knockout rugby, you need everybody to be on. Um, but look, it's a home game for them, so mm. they'll definitely be up for it. But um, they've some brilliant players, like, and they play so, so well in terms of their ability to move the ball um, in contact and around it. Um, and, you know, maybe it was just uh, an off day for a year west the other day, but, I, I, you know, I remember watching him playing Super Rugby and I thought his goal kicking was really inconsistent as well. Mm, yeah, no, a few people have said it's more than just uh, the weekend. So, Rory, last one, Bordeaux, Toulouse, Leinster, La Rochelle, I mean, it's an unbelievable chance now for Leinster. Definitely, yeah. I mean, Racing going out is, is a massive boost for Leinster. Mm. I mean, they were missing half their team on, Saturday, on Sunday and it showed they were both, like the, yesterday's games were both awful like after after the epic in, in Sandy Park it was uh, 160 minutes of trialless rugby and it was very brutal like a bit of drama at the end of, of them but um, not what we expect from quarterfinals in, in France but um, I think La Rochelle will be a really stiff stern test for Leinster and, and I think they they have a bit of that size that Leinster struggled with against Saracens you know Will Skelton the common denominator but also Weedy Antonio and that's a different challenge for them from what they faced on on you know, extra probably a bit more um, like them in terms of their athletic, athletic profile. And Toulouse would be very hard to beat if Toulouse can overcome Bordeaux. But like you can't underestimate Bordeaux because Bordeaux have beaten a really good Bristol team and a really bo- good Racing team without ever looking particularly impressive themselves. And, and they do have arguably the best out half in the game at the moment, the Jalabert, who's just outstanding. I know we nearly messed things up towards the end for them, but I think Leicester are, are the class team in the field. Um. You know, they, they got a, a pass for the quarter final, but they are being made to win it the hard way by going away to Exeter and, and La Rochelle. And we don't know where the final will be yet. But if they beat Exeter, La Rochelle, and Toulouse in the final, that's a pretty good way, then. Okay, very good. Neve Briggs, Rory O'Connor, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Good show. I'll see you. Monday Night yeah. Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in.